Okay, we have three handouts. One of them is old. You've got a blind spot handout. And the other two are brand new today. Uh, if you already have one, then you're good to go. If you if you didn't bring it back, then you've got extras there. But those two on the your left are new. Send me an email and schedule conflict, and that way I'll just, because uh, I probably won't remember now. Okay. okay, that'd be great. All right, thank you. So, like, I literally told myself not to forget it, but we're good. Yes, if you're just coming in, we have three handouts, and one of them is old from the other day, but there's an extra in case you need it, and here are the other two. Oh, I, I have I have my cheat sheets. So here's the, here's this class. Here's the next class, and I have a separate one. Victoria's in stats. She's in stats. Yeah, Victoria's in stats. Right, but she's not in the best of the other team. Okay. So I'm in research. Let's see if Victoria shows up. We'll find out. <laughs> These are like false positives and false negatives, right? I'm not in research. 
<coughs> Does everybody have the handouts? <coughs> we still have a minute, so I'll take quick attendance. Meg is here. Zach. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Okay, we have three handouts. These two are new, and you're welcome to have that one too, unless you happen to have that from leftover from the other day. Claire is here. Alex is here. Gabby. There's Liz. Jess is here. You're distributing your practice. Right, right, there you go. Hey, Seth. Want to join us in S&P, Seth? Yeah, I think I'm good. <laughs> You're good? <laughs> right. Okay, we've got 12.30. Why don't we get started? Good afternoon, S&P. Good afternoon. Wow. Happy, happy Wednesday. I've got some great news. A week from today, our first writing assignment is due. Let's just give it up for our first writing assignment. All right. All right. So we haven't had a writing assignment in here, but you probably had writing assignments in other classes. We've already had an exam in here. This will be our first writing assignment. And then once we get into the first one, uh, on average, every couple of weeks, another one is due. And the general drill is this, that once the paper is due, we're trying something new this semester, you're going to bring in your paper copies, but you're also going to turn in an electronic copy through Blackboard. So does everybody have this handout? We'll, we'll go through this one now. This is what's going to be due a week from now. I always like to give students plenty of time to do this. Okay, see, we've all got this, and we'll read it in just a moment. But this is also available electronically right here on Blackboard. So it says writing assignment due 12.30 p.m. Wednesday, September 30th. That's a week from now. Okay. Um, and uh, you can click on that, and you could submit your copy electronically. People who have me in other classes have already done this, uh, so they're used to the routine. Others, uh, others who have not yet submitted an electronic version for this class will be a little less familiar. But you click on that, and I'll be able to see the electronic copy. I grade it anonymously, and I can provide feedback to you. Just in case we have some kind of a glitch, maybe for the first assignment or two, I'll also ask you for a paper copy in this classroom. And then maybe as we get into the semester, we won't need the paper copies um, going forward. But just, just as a backup, make sure that uh, we're all good on that day. Okay, So that's going to be due a week from now. And just to remind you, this course does satisfy the power and justice requirement for your general education package. And the way that we get at that is looking at power and justice issues relating to disability. So we've had one or two readings already on disability. We're not that far into the semester. Now we have another pair of readings. And these will be available to you in your course pack. Toward the back of the course pack, there's a whole section that says writing assignment number one or writing assignment number two. This is writing assignment number one. A couple of readings there uh, for that one. And then when we come in on Wednesday, we'll have the chairs in a U again, and hopefully I can just say go, and we can have a 15-minute conversation uh, on power and justice issues, right? You can just talk about the different items that you are addressing in your writing assignment. You will have written about a 1,000 words for that, for that session, so everybody will have plenty to say, and I look forward to that session very much. I'll give you another reminder on Friday and also on, um, also on Monday, okay? Okay, just to make sure that we're all on track with this, I wonder if we could please get somebody to read at least the first couple of paragraphs here for us so that we're all very clear. And then as we see the second and third and fourth assignments, they take largely the same format. <clears throat> so can somebody start us out from Denison University mission statement? Volunteer reader. Thank you, Claire. Subsequently, 
across two or more paragraphs, address one, not both, of the following choices. A, reflect on a scenario about the psychology death course. Or B, evaluate the falsifiability of the author's claim that equal opportunities and policies have pushed negative attitudes underground. Is that claim falsifiable? Two, what specific idea from the flying watchmaker or from the greatest show on earth connects well with your, with our mission statement to become autonomous leaders and why? Develop your response across two or more paragraphs. And three, write specific idea, what specific idea from the course pack, sorry, from the course pack article, students with visual impairments in Israel, quality of life and subjective experience, connect well with our mission statement's reference to become morally discerning agents and why? Develop your response across two or more paragraphs. Okay, can we do just the next paragraph? Okay. Address these points in the order described above, but do not number your responses. Instead, your essay should smoothly transition across the above stated issues. Your grade will be based on the quality of your writing style, i.e. the grammar, clarity, succinctness, organization, and transition, and on novelty and persuasiveness of your prose. Okay, thank you, Claire. Thanks for, um, very much. So that's the, the assignment. And then down are some details about uh, font size that just helps us uh, keep things uh, consistent. So uh, you can read that at, at your own time. But hopefully you've got an idea about that. Again, things are typically listed in the course pack as course pack reading 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and, and they go in sequence. Here, we're going to be reading in part for course pack 10, which will be the reading for Friday, actually. And you'll have the chance to incorporate Friday's reading into your writing assignment. And then also there is yet another reading, which will be the reading for writing assignment one that's way, way in the back, and we haven't gotten that far yet. Right? So every once in a while, we'll have to go way to the back of that course pack and pick up the couple of readings that specialize on power and justice issues. I think you'll find them to be really, really interesting. And uh, through the past several years, I've done it now, I've done this course now for 15 years, but only maybe the past three or four have been power and justice related. We, we've added that component, and students typically really enjoy the conversation that we have. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this. And some of these issues are controversial, but uh, I, I think you'll also find them uh, really very, very informative. Okay, questions about that? And this again is due one week from today. Okay, now if I can bring us a little nearer in time, can we think about what's due for Friday? What's due for Friday, I could have made this a TED-Ed, but it, traditionally I've, I've done it on paper, so I thought we'd take a little break from TED-Ed and we'll do this one on paper for Friday. So the idea is, can you please answer these questions for Friday? There are seven of them uh, from a writing by one of my favorite authors, Richard Dawkins, happens to be an evolutionary uh, biologist uh, and zoologist, a terrific writer, terrific advocate for the public education of science. He's controversial for other reasons, but he actually does a lot of great work for the public education of science. So he's uh, written a book called The Blind Watchmaker, another one of my favorites. And then he has another one called The Greatest Show on Earth. And the last two questions, this is the back page of um, that other handout that you have, I, I think you'll find to be really interesting. He describes some terrific experiments from the University of Michigan, or Michigan State, from the Lenski lab that I just think are mind-bogglingly terrific. Really uh, a, a true highlight in experimentation in the biological and behavioral sciences, and we'll get you to summarize some of those for Friday. And then some of these uh, ideas that you're jotting down for Friday might make their way into what you're writing for next Wednesday. Okay? So instead of doing a TED-Ed, we'll have questions old school uh, on paper, and we'll see how that goes. Right. Who's all right with that? Yeah? Okay. So I think, I think we're all set up. And I think we'll, we'll go as far as we can for about 20 or 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes on Friday. And then we'll be delighted, uh, I'm delighted that we'll be joined by a visitor by Skype, uh, a fairly recent graduate. Her name is Rachel Reed from the class of 2013, was in this class in the spring of 2013. And Rachel is now in optometry school. Do you know Rachel? Okay. Was she your RA? Uh, she's also in the Oh, she was in your sorority. Okay, so you overlapped by one year. I wasn't sure if she's out long enough. So some of you might know Rachel. And then the Friday after that, we'll have Rachel Fenton. So I actually have three Rachels currently in graduate school, all graduates of this class. One is at Brown studying neuroscience and pain reception. Two of them are in optometry schools. One is at optometry school just down the road here in uh, Ohio State. 
Her name is Rachel Fenton. She'll be with us next Friday, this coming Friday. Rachel Reed will join us by Skype from Houston. She's at Houston's optometry school. And she'll tell us uh, about applying to optometry school and applying to graduate schools and um, all kinds of fun things. So we'll have about 20 minutes from very recent graduates uh, from, from these classes. I think Rachel Fenton will be here live. And uh, Rachel Reed will be here by Skype. Okay? So it should be a really, really fun session on Friday also. Okay? All right. So that's where we're going for the next couple of sessions. All right, why don't we get into our discussion of the human eye. That'll um, maybe make a nice context for our conversations with the upcoming Rachels, right, who are really specializing in the eye. And last time around, we were talking about the facts of light. We spent quite a bit of time on the facts of light. And we noticed that there were wave-like properties, there were particle-like properties. I wonder if we could start with the wave-like properties. Okay? And can somebody tell me about that? What are some wave-like properties of light? Okay, Meg's got something. Uh, transverse okay, transverse versus longitudinal wave. So really good. And just for fun, why don't we do why don't we do the transverse wave? Which one pertains to light and which one pertains to sound? There's transverse and there's longitudinal. Which goes with which? Yeah, and longitudinal is acoustic, okay? So let's do the transverse wave, and this is the one that's perpendicular. So in both cases, we're gonna have a traveling disturbance, which is how we define a wave. And I'll go from left to right, but now we have the perpendicular local motions, okay? So we'll ask you to raise your hands up and down. Let's go ahead and do that. So make sure we're on track with that. And this is what goes, this is the stadium wave, and this is the one that everybody is very familiar with, okay? So unbeknownst to the largely drunken sports fans in football arenas, they're actually doing a transverse wave. Um, uh, they probably wouldn't be able to get that out, but, but they are doing it, and it always looks really cool. Somebody want to remind us about some other properties of, of wave-like properties of, of light? So it travels in a transverse wave. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but not, not quite in the longitudinal, so it's not the longitudinal wave, that's going to be acoustic energy, but the other wave-like property is that it oscillates along a particular plane of polarization. Right? And so we, we can talk in a moment about the different planes of polarization, and that'll bring us to our, a little reminder about what we did with respect to our different kinds of filters. Right? But they're, they're moving along a particular kind of a plane as they're moving in their transverse wave. Can we do the, just for fun, can we do the uh, longitudinal wave, okay, the acoustic wave? So we're going to go like this. Okay? This one's harder to do. Don't knock over your water bottles. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't knock over your computers. You might need to swing over your, your laptop. So here we go. I'm still going from left to right, just like the good old days. Okay, that hasn't changed. Keep your eye on me. All right? Okay, right? So that's, that's what's going on there. And now we have a parallel relationship between the overall direction of the wave and the direction of the local particles, right? They're also going now in a parallel manner as opposed to a perpendicular manner. So we have those two different kinds of waves from physics. Every once in a while here, we do touch on physics in our psychophysics, and we'll also be talking about some biology today. Right? Okay, so we have those two different kinds of properties. What else can you tell me about um, maybe like the particle properties of, of light? You know about the particle properties of light. What is the particle? Photons. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And yeah, go ahead. Jake's. Okay. The higher energy and lower energy. There's a continuum there of energy. And and what does it mean to say that something is higher energy? Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Higher energy. Okay. Maybe Meg's got it. Yeah. Right, okay, so we can think of, actually, we might think of it this way, the number of oscillations per unit space, why don't we do it just like that, okay? Oscillations per unit space. And what kind of unit of measure might we be using here to measure the, the wavelengths? Nanometers, okay, and we said a nanometer was? 
a billionth, yeah. Maybe you've heard in other classes about <laughs> nanotechnology. Every so many years, we'll bring somebody in through the Anderson Science Lecture. And a few years back, we brought in a nanotechnologist, which is fantastic. This person's entire career is studying things at, at nanoscales and nanoseconds, nanometers, uh, all kinds of really cool things going on down there. In psychology, we rarely get down to that level of detail. I think biology generally doesn't get down that low. We get down to maybe millimeters and, um, and frequently down to milliseconds in time, millimeters in space. It's usually where psychology is operating. I was aware of some finding in physics where they were able to measure something um, down to 1 times 10 to the negative 43. <laughs> Okay. That's pretty precise. 1 times 10 to the negative 43. We're operating at 1 times 10 to the negative third, usually in psychology, when we're measuring millimeters or milliseconds. Okay. So uh, pretty neat to think about those different orders of magnitude, the, the uh, scales of time and space. Okay, So that's a little bit about the background there. Um, can we all draw in the air the luminance profile for a polarized filter? So just draw it in the air. We can Okay, all right, I see all kinds of things going on there. People are, are drawing either S-shapes or inverted S-shapes. That's about the, the right way to go there. And what are on the different axes as we're drawing that kind of a shape? What's on, what's on the y-axis or the ordinate? Number of photons, right? And we'll just leave it at number of photons. And there are, there are too many to count. I've already crudely called it 0 to 100. You know, low levels of photons to high levels of photons. And on this axis, what was going on there? Go ahead, Alex. Polarization plane. Polarization plane, and we can think of that as being measured in angles akin to uh, what we'd have on a protractor, right? So we're, we have some planes of polarization that are passing through, others are being attenuated, some are almost entirely blocked. You could have a really good filter that would block all of them. I get my stuff for $1.98 at the $1.98 optics store, so it doesn't block all of them, but if, it, you, you can get the idea of how those work. Okay, that was the polarized filter. We had a different kind of a filter. So what was the other one called? Smoked, okay. Can, can we all draw that? How did that look? Okay, that's flat as a pancake, right? So that, that profile is as flat as can be, but it's about half the way down, so it's blocking out all planes of polarization equally. What point did we make about our eyes versus insect eyes in those different kinds of filters? Somebody help us out with how that went. Our eyes versus insect eyes, or maybe even some bird eyes. Is that, is that a hand clip? No, okay. How do, how do they differ? Okay, we'll go with Zach. Yeah, insect eyes are sensitive to the planes of polarization, whereas uh, our, our eyes are not. Okay? So um, that's a great advantage that they have. And we talk about the African dung beetle being able to take advantage of polarized light to find essentially straight lines up in the, in, in the sky. And I have a really cool sky video coming up. I want to make sure that uh, as we get into today's conversation, we do alert you to an unusual celestial event coming up this Sunday. Does anybody know what's going to happen this Sunday? We're going to have the joint occurrence of a supermoon. Who's heard of that before? A supermoon? Okay. And also a lunar eclipse. And those two have not been coincident for the last 32 years, and they will not again until, I think, 2029. So um, more on that and, and the moon uh, as we get into physiological optics in, in just a little bit. Okay, so lots of ideas uh, to go through. Um, why don't we do this? Let me put up... This was the PowerPoint that was driving the video that we had and also driving the TED-Ed that you finished for the other day. Here's what we've already talked about so far today. Some smoke filter stuff. Okay, um, why don't we do it like this? I'll let you look at your your notes for a moment, thinking back to the TED-Ed questions from the other day. I'll let these slide on by. I'll try a different kind of an exercise. This is all under the title called Physiological Optics. So some of these might look familiar. And I wonder if either Claire or Alex could throw down one of those lights. It's a little bit faint up here. We get better contrast if we could turn off those lights. Sorry to put you to sleep there, but I think we see these things a little bit better. And what we'll pretend is I'm the um, good-willed but ignorant uncle, and I'm going to pretend that I don't, I don't know what physiological optics is, and I'm asking you, my nieces and nephews, um, so what kinds of things did you learn in, in class today? And you'll say you learned about physiological optics. And I'll say, well, I don't really know what that is. What can you tell me about physiological optics? And we'll let you just um, sort of inform me, you know, not in a verbatim manner, but just whatever kinds of ideas you remember from this. You'll uh, try to teach your well-meaning but not well-informed Uncle. Okay, so I'll let you look over these. You can see some terminology. 
some of that you might have been clear on, some of that you might not have been clear on. Okay, all right? So, so I'm your well-meaning uh, uncle, not well informed about this. Uh, you, you, I heard you were taking a course in sensation or perception. I heard there was something about optics or physiological optics. Sounds like a mouthful. What can, what can people tell me about that? Meg's going to start us off, okay? Um, well, like, travels in a straight line, so that when it hits um, the cornea, the light bends, um, so that it can hit a certain target so that we can perceive. Okay. Light. Okay, so, so there's an interaction there of physics and physiology and, and biology, right? So light is traveling in straight lines, okay? <coughs> yeah, light is traveling in straight lines. Um, and then it hits something and it bends. Okay. Uh, hits hits the cornea and it bends. Okay. I think Jake was going to add something to that. Um, just like your basic photoreceptor with the broad and cones. Okay. Yeah. So it's, I, I I vaguely remember rods and cones from Intro to Psych, but so, so what's going on with the rods and cones? Okay. Rods are more sensitive than cones in general. Okay. What, what does it mean to say that they're they're more sensitive? Okay. Can anybody help us out with that? That might not have been entirely clear. Did, did you want to try that? Yeah. I think that rods are more sensitive because humans we operate more day and night, so they get more light energy. Okay. Good, okay, yeah, cones tend to specialize for us in color. Um, rods are better at really all light levels. They're picking up something. They can, you, you can imagine that in order to get a cone to do its thing, you might need to have a certain number of photons there, right? And you might need to have a relatively large number of photons to get for a cone to do its phototransduction. You can have a rod do its thing, do its phototransduction, with many, many fewer photons. It has been said that there are some rods that can actually pick up one photon. If you, could, if you could be in complete darkness, right, complete darkness, and just somehow shoot one photon toward, toward Jess or towards Sibel, right, can, can your eye do anything with that? Well, that's probably not going to be enough to get a cone going. And it probably wouldn't be enough to get a rod going, but a rod would at least have a shot at it. Okay? A rod can be sensitive to even a single photon. Um, and by the way, there's some really exciting work going on now in a branch of psychophysics called single photon psychophysics. And it's being led by a guy named David Williams. And I'm telling you his name, not because you have to write it down, but because David Williams is a really, really big cheese in vision science. He's at the University of Rochester. And he is a graduate of this course from 1975. <laughs> so way before I came on board here, um, he, he's a graduate from Denison, and he was in this room taking S&P way back in, in the 1970s. And now he's doing single photon psychophysics, getting all kinds of grants to do that. And by the way, the University of Rochester is just down the road from Eastman Kodak. Uh, and some of you might know that they were really big in film for many, many decades. So they pour a lot of money into vision research. So the University of Rochester is very well funded in single photon psychophysics and all, all versions of vision research. And a really big cheese there is David Williams, a graduate of this classroom in this class. Okay? So yes, so the rods are more sensitive than the cones are. They might be able to grab either one photon or a small number of photons. You would need many, many more photons for the cones to do their thing. Okay? Cool. Okay, so now I'm learning that light can be bent. It's going to be grabbed by some photoreceptors after it's focused onto the retina. What else can people tell me? <clears throat> Go ahead, Maggie. Well, um, you can express the strength of that bend um, of light in terms of diopters. In terms of what, what was diopters, I, I actually know what it is. No, 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 you were just right. You were just right. Okay. So yeah, we can get the the magnitude. Of the light is coming along, and then it's going to get bent at the cornea, right? And it can bend like this. <laughs> it can bend like this, a little steeper, or it can, right? Okay. How, how steeply is that bend occurring, right? And we can measure that. It's kind of an angular bend, and. Um, we can measure that in a unit that isn't millimeters, it isn't milliseconds, it's called diopters. Okay? And in some classes, in physics classes, you'd, they'd probably have you bring in a calculator and actually compute the diopters. I won't ask you to do that, but there, there's a, a formula that's fairly straightforward that relies on, well, I'll let you tell me, how does, 
what, what trigonometric function is used for the diopter measure? Does anybody recall? <coughs> trigonometric function. Yeah. The arc tangent. Who remembers hearing about that thing, right? There was sine, cosine, and tangent, right? And then there's arc tangent. The, the basic rule about that, and all you really would need to remember, is that when you were in ninth or tenth grade geometry, whenever you had that, you learned a whole bunch of rules about converting line lengths into angles and angles into line lengths, and you went back and forth between those two. Lengths to angle, angles to length. Who remembers generally doing that? Does that sound familiar? And you learned about sine, cosine, and tangent, and so forth. So when we have distal and proximal stimuli, we sometimes find it advantageous to talk about them in terms of how many meters big they are, how many centimeters. Sometimes it's helpful to talk about them in terms of angles. Okay? And it's a little confusing sometimes for students to think about how they're expressed in angles. I'm going to turn this up before we lose everyone. How they're expressed in angles. But can somebody just remind us of the distinction between the distal stimulus and the proximal stimulus? How do those two differ from each other? Distal stimulus and proximal stimulus. Let's go with Alex, and then we'll go back to Abby. Um, distal stimulus is like the object in the environment. Uh -huh. And uh, proximal stimulus is the object in the environment. Okay, at the level that it's hitting the eye. Did you want to add to that, or is that about? Oh yeah, I was just going to say it's, it's like what is being bounced off of your eye. Yeah, or what's, what's landing on your receptor. Right. right. That's, that's okay. So if I were just to draw a really small line, let's pretend that's one centimeter. Okay, very very simple stimulus, and it's easy to talk about lines out here in the real world as being a certain length. Maybe that's one centimeter. Probably isn't. We're going to call that though one centimeter. If I'm a certain distance away, 57 centimeters, it works out that this one centimeter object or stimulus out here, at a distance of 57 centimeters, occupies one degree of visual angle on my eye. Okay? So what's cool about that is now we can talk about what is the size of the stimulus out there in the real world, what is my viewing distance, those are all distances, and we can also express it now as how, what fraction of my retina might be stimulated, and we can descri describe that in terms of angles, just like you would have angles on a protractor. So it's one degree of visual angle. And there's a, a formula that, that's in here, the arc tangent of uh, that ratio, how, how long is this thing, how far away am I, we take the arc tangent of that, those two numbers, and we wind up with the degrees on our, on our retina. Okay. All right, can somebody tell me a little bit more about um, things expressed on the retina in terms of degrees of visual angle? There's a couple of slides in here that talk about degrees of visual angle that are kind of interesting, which you might want to inform your uncle about. Some of which might be particularly interesting this coming Sunday when we have a super moon and a lunar eclipse. So there's the arctangent formula. How big is the stimulus? That was one that was one centimeter, and my viewing distance was 57 centimeters. If we take the arc tangent of that, we wind up with one degree. I don't know if anybody picked up on this line. So let's talk about, uh, maybe you can tell me about the optic disc. What is the optic disc, and why do we have it? Where is it? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Excellent, okay, so uh, we have an optic disc at the back of our eye. The back of our eye is filled largely with photoreceptors, tons and tons of photoreceptors on the order of many, many millions, right? Probably on the order of maybe overall 126 million, uh, you know, something uh, that, uh, that order. Then we have this small disc that contains no photoreceptors whatsoever, and Claire had it just right. It's this uh, it's a big cable, right? And all of these ganglion cells, we have different kinds of cells inside of the eye. All these ganglion cells have axons, and the axons all loop together, and they form something like a communication cable. You can think of it like a, a telephone cable that goes out of the back of your eye. Okay. Um, which side? Retinal side? Temporal side? Um, nasal side, I should say, or temporal side? Does anybody know? <laughs> Nasal side, okay, so uh, it's not dead center, it's more toward the nose than toward the ears, right? So slightly nasal in its location. And there's a spot there where there's no photoreception. 
Right? There's, no, there's no photoreception there at all. And it's important, though, that we have that because we have to send information from the eye to the thalamus, which is a relay station, all the way back to the visual cortex. Okay? So what evolution has opted for uh, or, or converged on is the idea that we're going to have a small patch where we can't see anything, but that allows us to get some information from the retina back to the primary visual cortex. Okay? All right. So um, why don't we go ahead and take a moment and do the blind spot demo. So because we have an optic disc, we have a region of our retina that doesn't contain photoreceptors. So does anybody need this handout? This is the handout from the other day, and we have more up here just in case you need it. Anybody need the handout? Okay, sure. That's fine. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Okay, why don't we do it like this? Um, so I'm holding this with, uh, holding, holding it in my right hand. If you'll excuse my back, I'll turn my back to you just so that my right is, is your right and my left is your left. Some people are not quite so comfortable with rights and left. Okay? So I'm holding this with my right hand. I'm holding it out at about arm's length. Okay? And I've got the X on the window side of the room, and I've got that small circle on the door side of the room. Is everybody in that orientation? Is that working for us? Okay. Now that we're holding that with our right hand, can we take our left hand and cover our left eye? Okay. And at about arm's length, works at about arm's length, can you look straight at the X where it says fixation cross? And hopefully, you're getting that small circle to disappear into your optic disc, into your blind spot. How many people are... Uh, able to get that small circle to disappear in there. Okay, right? as, this is actually nicely laid out. This is by um, a, an author named Bob Sekuler. Really quite nicely laid out. That thing lands right in your body. What I think is interesting, if you keep that same position going and wiggle it around a little bit, uh, keep your eye on the X, okay? and you can actually move the... You, you can move that around quite a bit, and that circle still remains largely invisible. You have a, which is all to say that you have a pretty big hole in the back of your eye. <laughs> okay? That's all still missing. How many people are having that experience? Okay? Right. So that, that's working pretty well. Why don't we do it this way? If we hold it just like that again. Now can we uh, turn it over? Okay? And we'll put it in our left hand. So now the X is a little bit more medial. The circle is a little bit more lateral. The circle is over that way. Let's cover our right eye. So we're now just switching it around. And keep your eye on the X again. Again, this should be at about arm's length. And now what's happening is that the circle should again be in your optic disc, which is to say your blind spot. And you can move it around. Keep your eye on that X. And hopefully now you've found the blind spot in your other eye. How many people have found it just like that? So just, just a note about that. Meg reminded us of an important fact of light, which is that light travels in straight lines. Let's stay in that orientation. I'm covering my right eye. I've got this in my, my left hand. So this now, I'm looking at the X. And the dot is leftish. Light travels in straight lines, so it's going to hit the, if you will, the right more portion, the, the right side of my left eye, which is open. Okay? So that's going to be, the right side of my left eye is relatively nasal. Right? So that hopefully convinces you that this optic disc is actually nasally positioned. It's closer to the nasal than it is toward the temples. It's not dead center. Okay? Who's getting that? Yeah? Okay. Now, what we know from this slide is we can ask, how big is this thing? And that blind spot is approximately six degrees of visual angle. Okay? And uh, the rule of thumb that we have actually on an earlier slide, the rule of thumb is this. If you hold your arm out all the way and you put your thumb up, okay, and you can cover uh, one of your eyes, okay, cover your other eye, that thumb is occupying about one degree of visual angle as a first approximation. It works out pretty well. And in the video, I, I talked about what some people object to. Is that, well, some people have bigger thumbs, some people have smaller thumbs. What's the answer to that problem? Go ahead, Tom. Um, it's, like it's, correlated it's correlated to the length of your arm, right? So going back to this simple equation, if I have a slightly wider thumb, I probably also have a slightly longer arm, so I can increase the viewing distance. So it's a pretty good metric. So if you're just looking at the width of your thumbnail, that's about one degree of visual angle. Okay? What's fascinating is that the full moon, and we've got one coming up, occupies about half a degree of visual angle. And you, you wouldn't think about it intuitively. If you stick your thumb up in the air like this, you can put the entire full moon not only behind your thumb, but behind about half of your thumb. The whole full moon dissolves into there. Okay? 
pretty interesting. Right? So the, the full moon is only about half a degree of visual angle, and we have a six degree of visual angle blind spot. So you could fit in many, many full moons, approximately 12 full moons would, would cover your, your blind spot. You wouldn't know that something was out there. Pretty cool. So riddle me this, how come if, if you've got this big blind spot in your left eye and you've got a big blind spot in your right eye, how come you don't feel like you've got a blind spot? You've got to use one of these things in an S&P class, you have to cover this eye, it's got to be in the right position, everything has to be just right to me. How come it doesn't feel like, you know, we're walking around with a blind spot? Go ahead. If you're, if an object is one of the Excellent, right? So it is absolutely true that for something that happens to be landing in this particular eye's blind spot right now for a given fixation, then um, that same region of space will be covered by the other eye. Okay? So actually we've got photoreceptors on essentially every region of space that's in front of us. Right? We've got photoreceptors everywhere. A given eye might not have it, but the other eye will, be, will have a complementary bit. Okay? So who's following that? I think that's a really good answer. Somebody might quibble with that answer and say, yeah, but how come when I cover this eye, I can still walk around and I don't get, like, I can see everything over here. I can see some things over here. I don't get quite that far over that way. But I don't have this big gaping hole there. I still don't have photoreceptors there. I can't be compensating with this eye because it's closed. And I don't get the feeling subjectively that I've got this big, big hole in my visual field. And yet somehow it has to be true that I have a big hole in my visual field. Who's following the problem? Is it okay, right? Do you have an idea? Does it have to do with the fact that your eyes are like constantly in motion? Okay. It like, it detects, like, your eyes will detect like, changes in stimuli, so if your eyes are constantly moving, everything's constantly changing. Okay, right, especially if I'm, if I'm uh, a Gibsonian and I'm moving around, right? okay. and I'm moving my eyes and I'm moving my head, then I can, uh, I can probably fill in with a lot of information. I think I saw another hand, too. Was there some other idea about that? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Jake. And then, then I'm sure the exact hand process, but I think the brain is called autofill. The autofill, okay. Okay, we'll come back to the autofill. Did you have a, another idea? On? I, would, I mean, I was just thinking about, um, like, blindsight and all those other... Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, if the corpus callosum is cut, corpus callosum is connecting left and right, yeah, okay. So you might not be able to, like, see or, like, smell, or, like, you don't have, like, the bilateral connections. Okay, right, yes, we don't have bilateral connections if we lose our corpus callosum, right, okay. So, okay. Ah, okay, okay. Well, uh, yeah, certainly the rest of the brain is intact. The problem is, uh, earlier in the process, we don't have any photoreception. So I like, uh, there are lots of good ideas here. First, you have two eyes. Generally, it's not a problem for that reason. Even if you're walking around with one, you can do eye movements. But for any given eye movement, you might be there for just a few hundred milliseconds and you move to the next position, next position. No matter where you're moving, you're always going to have a blind spot, right? So, I mean, you can kind of fill it in. Like the, the autofill idea, the problem with the autofill idea is, it's hard to measure that, right? It's a bit of a guess. But on, on the other hand, we can also say that this time around, it's Alex and Meg that are wearing red shirts, and Abby's got a red shirt on. I mean, that isn't red, right? The rays are not colored, and yet I'm seeing red. So getting back to the very first week of class, our brains are creating a simulation for us that is based at least partly on what's out here in the real world, but it's not based entirely on what's in the real world. Because if it were, somehow it would have to report to us that we're missing this big six degree circle in your right eye's field, and yet we don't have that experience subjectively. So the autofill <laughs> is doing its thing based perhaps on what it's picking up as we're moving our eyes around and so forth. It's, it's making a guess is the, is the notion about that. So really an interesting problem. Right? We, we don't fully understand how the eye is doing that, the eye brain is doing that, but it seems to be doing that pretty convincingly for us. Okay, so uh, that's that's that demo. Any questions on this 921 PowerPoint before we put it away for good? I always like to do this. A show of hands, how many people are like me and you have some kind of correction to your eyes? I have contact lenses and occasionally you'll see me wearing my glasses. I've been wearing contacts for as long as you've been alive. How many people have some kind of correction to their eyes? Okay. How many people don't have corrections? Okay. All right, so we have some folks who are not at all correct. Are those who have some correction, hands real high? 
How many of you are myopic? You're nearsighted? Okay. Do you, if you wouldn't mind share, I'll, I'll share with you. I'm myopic also, and my, um, my diopter correction is minus four. So sometimes people will tell you that they have their eyes corrected, and they'll float you a number, like a minus four or a positive two or something like that. Anybody want to share some of their... Yeah, thanks. I know my right eye is negative 3.5 and my left is negative 2.5. Okay, yeah. So as it turns out, we get this refraction, the refracting of light, and uh, your, your left eye might be more refracting or less refracting than the other. Okay, so yours are quite different from each other by a full diopter. Jess has something. Mine are both negative 8.5. Both negative 8.5, okay. Okay, uh, and Liz. I'm not sure what mine were, but I got LASIK surgery. You did. And so they were like, my left eye was like minus two worse than my right eye. Was minus two worse, okay. Yeah, so, it was like a really okay, so yeah, so they're very different. Okay, minus eight is, is fairly large, but you're wearing contacts and you, you function just, okay, all right, really, really good, yeah. Um, so now I've got another problem because I'm, I'm way older than you and you'll, you'll get this uh, frequently by the time you get to 40. Now what happens is you might be myopic like I am, but then this a changeable portion of your refraction, which is the lens. The cornea bends a certain amount, the lens has a variable amount, and it can go more like this if it has some object close to it and it needs to really bend the light, and then I need to look from down here all the way back to Sabelle or Asara, and then my lens will go like that, and so I get some kind of bending. As you get older, you don't bend so well. <laughs> you, get, you get kind of stuck here or there, so you need uh, some kind of continuous correction. You need maybe bifocals. You need one level of correction for distance and a different level of correction for what's up close. Okay? So um, uh, a lot is going on with that lens and as you age that does tend to stiffen. Okay? All right. Another fun factoid. There's so much to talk about here. There was a really fun article uh, probably 20 years ago that said there's a very modest but statistically significant co-variation between your type of eye correction, whether you're negative and myopic or positive and hyperopic, and whether you're introverted versus extroverted. Now you'd think that this kind of a thing inside of your eyeball right, is so physiological, right, uh, physiological optics, that would have nothing to do with a personality trait like introversion and extroversion. And it's not a big effect, but it's there statistically. If you get a, a significantly large population, you can see that uh, introverts tend to be somewhat myopic, Okay, and extroverts tend to be somewhat hyperopic. Um, cool. We wouldn't, we wouldn't find it here in this room because we have too small a sample. But if you get a sufficiently large sample, it's there. So there's a little connection to social psychology, which we don't always get to connect to here in, in uh, S&P. Okay. All right, so before we put this away, any questions on any aspect of physiological optics? Okay, please. I was just curious, how does like colored wine Okay, very good. So we're going to have a whole section on, on color blindness. But uh, so uh, just to take it through the sequence, here comes a lot of light my way, right? And it's going to hit my cornea, and that's going to give me some refraction. It's going to hit my lens, and will give me some refraction, depending on what state that's in. And then what's going to happen after all of that, we do get some phototransduction. And it might be that in color blindness or color... Um, color anomaly, uh, when there's anomalous color perception, you have either fewer kinds of cones or you have cones that have different peak wavelengths. Okay? And um, most humans have three, but there are many of us that only have two. And uh, we're going to have an entire section on a very interesting um, uh, island in the South Pacific called Pingalap. Who's heard of Pingalap? Who's not heard of Pingalap? Okay. Well, uh, we just had a tragedy a couple weeks ago. We lost our, our good friend Oliver Sacks. But Oliver Sacks went with some of his friends to the island of Pingalap where 25% of the population is colorblind. They don't have any... Um, uh, they're missing cones, I think, entirely. Right? And um, so, so it's not a refractive problem. Right? It's not a matter of bending it and getting it just to the right spot. It's a matter of uh, what wavelengths of light can you pick up. Okay? Other questions on physiological optics? Okay. okay, so we have a little bit of time to get into what was cooking for today, and that was the 923 bit, and we're talking about phototransduction and retinal ganglion cells, lots of uh, neurobiology here. Okay. Set the stage for that. And we had a bunch of TED-Ed questions, so why don't I just um, read for us some of the TED-Eds, and then we can go back to the PowerPoint if we need to. 
And the, the first TED Ed question was, why is it that the eye is considered part of the brain, but the ear is not considered part of the brain? Anybody want to remind us about that? We'll go with Gabby and then with Liz. Okay. Okay, right. So yeah, the eye does come from that early embryonic stage, just like the, the brain cells. Did you want to add to that, or was that the whole thing? Uh, I was going to say sort of that same thing, but also just the fact that um, the eyes are made of the same tissue as the neurons, okay. while uh -huh. the ear tissue is not. Yep, okay, right. And is that the whole thing, Melanie? Have we gotten all there? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> that, that's about all, all we need to know about that. And of course, in the very first day of class, we talked about some interesting S&P issues in embryological development. We were trying to figure out, can a fetus feel pain? and what would have to be true for a fetus to feel pain. By the way, does anybody recall what one of the, the major conclusions was from that article? I know that's several weeks ago. But we were reading the article about the issue of fetal pain, and pain is a sensation, so it's in sensation and perception. Um, what, what were some of the conclusions from that article? Tani's got something. Okay, right, yeah, so, so and, and it's, for some people, it's an ethically relevant variable as to whether the, the organism can feel pain or not. In this case, the organism is a human fetus, and it might have been something like the 27th week or uh, whatever that number of weeks was. Does anybody remember what had to happen physiologically for the pain to be present? There certain things had to be in place. Physiologically, there had, there had to be, at the 27-week mark or thereabouts, something was happening at the physio level that makes the psychological phenomena of pain possible. Does anybody recall what that was? Well, Meg, Meg, dig, <laughs> Meg did a good dig here. All right, what you got, Meg? The thalo thalamo cortical connections, right? So we have the thalamus, we have the cortex, and both of those might be developing but not yet connected to each other. And if the ankle bone isn't talking to the leg bone, then we don't have a connection there, right? We have to get the thalamus, which is a relay station, talking to or synaptically connected to the, the cortex in order for there to be the psychological experience of pain. Okay. All right. So anyway, that was our little uh, entree into the embryo. The next question that we had is to explain two ways in which the construction of the human eye is counterintuitive. It was counterintuitive in a couple of ways. Anybody want to help us? Okay. We'll go with Sibel and then back to Melanie. Thank you. At least for our species, the photoreceptors are going the wrong way, right? They're, they're not pointing toward the incoming light. They're pointing away from the incoming light, seemingly counterintuitively. Okay. All right. Somebody else? Yeah, okay. Um, for the vertebrates, I think it was all vertebrates. Uh -huh. but, um, when lights are turned down, neurotransmitter is, re is released. Is increased, more. yeah, right. So instead of when lights are turned, and the lights are turned up, there's less of a released neurotransmitter, which is that's right. And, and do you remember what, which neurotransmitter it was? Glutamate. You said, yeah, glutamate. Okay. So yeah, when I go like, see if I can get these up. Okay, those are all the way up, and then I go down. As they went down, now a lot more glutamate has been released in your retina. I'll turn them back up. Here we go, and we get a reduction in glutamate release. It seems counterintuitive, right, that we get a reduction in that substance, um, but not all animals are like that. Uh, some of the other animals that have evolved eyes use many very similar mechanisms, but maybe they use them in, in an opposite arrangement. Okay? So there's still gl glutamate fluctuations that are tied to light level fluctuations out here in the distal stimulus, but they just happen to have the opposite kind of configuration. Kind of interesting that it would happen that way. Okay, we have a, a moment or two, and I just wanted to uh, try this. I think I brought my wiffle ball with me. I did bring my wiffle ball, okay? And, and what I like to do is say that this is a photon, demonstrated by this, okay? And every year when I do this demonstration, I say that you know, the light's coming in from this way, this is where the pupil is, it's going to bounce off the back of the eye and has to be caught by the photoreceptor kind of on the rebound. Do we have a volunteer photoreceptor? I'll try to throw this thing against the back wall and we'll see if somebody can catch it on the rebound. Anybody? Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, why don't we do it right over this way? Yeah, we have a little bit of space that way. I'll try not to hit Sabelle. I'll see if I can get it up there. And why don't you stand up? And all right, see if you can get. Okay, I'll get it as close over your, like, straight over your head. All right, but don't look at me because the photoreceptor can't see me. All right, here it comes one, two, three. Hey, all right, he caught a photon. All right, <laughs> this guy belongs in David Williams' lab. Right, he's a rod that caught a photon. All right. And then we get into a, now that he caught the photon, we have a cis-trans isomerization. 
remembers hearing about that little ditty. Okay? Can you show me what that looked like? This is, I think I did it. Oh, there it is. Wow. Which is cis? Cis? Cis boomba? Yeah, is that it? Cis? <laughs> Cis trans isomerization. So normally the photoreceptor's pigment will be in this kind of configuration. Then when it catches the photon bouncing off the back there, as Jake caught it, okay, it's going to change its shape. It's a conformational change. And that alone is enough to release some neurotransmitter, which gets the whole ball game going for this action potential that's going to make its way or, or propagate from the retina all the way to the thalamus to uh, the back of the brain. Okay. All right. All right, thank you, Jake. Thank, thanks for doing that, and good catch. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. What else can we do? Why don't we Why don't we end with this one, and we'll pick up uh, some more of these next time we're back. Can somebody remind us, what does it mean to say that the peaks don't match perception? The peaks don't match perception. Thanks, Alex. Is that, um, I guess like in the case of red, it's more of a yellow color. Okay, so yeah, so the, the red, the quote-unquote red cone, right? Yeah. yeah, its peak sensitivity would have been kind of the middle of our range, and maybe yellowish, right? So we call it the red cone, but that's a bit of a, a wavelength, a bit of a misnomer, because the wavelengths are not themselves colored, and our perception of red really is not peaked anyway at that, that same level where that cell or that uh, cone type is maximally sensitive, okay? So why don't we pick up on that idea? That's a, a complex idea, and I don't want to... Um, just end on it, never come back to it again. Why don't we start on that when we come back on Friday? And also you'll have your answers on Friday for, for this. Right. Thanks for a great session, and I look forward to being joined by one of our Rachels on Friday. Tell us all about optometry school and physiological optics. Okay, that's fine. Um, would you like me to do this on Word doc or something and send it to you? Uh, you? You could, or if you just want to hang on to it, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's fine. You probably already sent me an email on that. I, okay, uh, do I have one? It's probably... I'll send one again. Oh, no, that's okay. If you sent it to me, what I would have done is I would have grabbed it and put it in my S&P folder. So I've got it, so that's cool. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Sure, thank All right. you. No, no, I'll make a note of it also here that Claire will be out next time.